Welcome to the Evolve to Win show with Heather and Paul. And today, instead of Paul, we have a special guest, Mike Ruffalo. How are you, Mike? Good, Heather. How are you? I'm great, thanks. Thanks for being with us today. No problem. My pleasure. Mike has such a tremendous background, and he's been former CEO of three companies, both publicly traded and privately, uh, including CIO of a Fortune 500, yes? Right. And you're also executive chairman of Edgeware, which is a tech company, right? That's right. So 30 plus years in the tech industry? Yes. All right. So you have a, you have a lot that you can share with us on business success and leadership. Um, and, I, and I'm hoping to pull some of that from you. Sure. But what I find most fascinating is your concept called phase two. That's right. Um, so we've gotten to know Mike actually on the tennis courts, also happens to be a fairly competitive athlete. On a scale from one to ten, um, certainly on the upper half. Twelve. Of that. Yeah. There ish. you go. Yeah. Exactly. Go. Especially That's... when I'm playing uh, Paul. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I know. Um, and so you have you and your wife Lisa actually play together as well. You've we been do. married for thirty four years. That's do right. I have that right? That's right. Um, and adult children and the newest addition to your family is your proud proud grandfather. To add to the list of fun things in my life, um, yeah, we have a little uh, granddaughter named Ellie. She's six months. Oh, that's awesome! Congratulations so, on you. that. Thank you so much. All right, so I do want to jump into this concept that you call Phase Two, mm-hmm. um, and we actually got to experience just a little bit of that. But can you just share for our listeners, what does this phase two mean for you? Well, um, I'm glad that we're not going to talk about too much about career and, and my background because I'm very passionate and very interested in sharing at least my thoughts about phase two because it's the world that I live in today. And I think it's a world that all of us either do or would like to live in in the future. And what I mean by uh, phase two is it's, it's kind of hard to define and it's, and it's kind of unique to every individual. But it basically means when you're at the point in your life where you're in a position, the fortunate position, to start to have more control and more choices over where you spend your time, where you set your personal, professional, and relationship goals, and basically where you're in a position where you're thinking about, how do I want to spend, let's say, the second half of my life? How do I want to spend the next 25 years? How do I want to spend the next five years for that matter? But the idea there is phase two is where you take control of your life. As I think most people are, um, in your early part of your life, you're very focused on kind of the basic things, um, you know, getting through college, potentially, you know, getting married, having children, doing well in your career, making enough money, funding your 401k, all the different things that we worry about. And having gone through that process, I can tell you that it really does, in many regards, kind of limit your choices because you have obligations. You know, you're an adult, you have things you have to take care of. And so when you're in a position where most of that is kind of in your rearview mirror and you can actually start focusing on some of the passions that maybe you didn't have time for in the past, that's what I think is phase two. And I'll give you at least some examples of what I'm doing in my personal phase two, but I think it's something that everyone should aspire to and frankly make as a goal. So just to be clear, we're not we're not really talking about retirement when you say phase two. Absolutely. You may or may not be retired, in fact, mm-hmm. but you're talking about this this stage of life where you've kind of gotten past some of those have to do's, the need to's, mm-hmm. right? And you're starting to be more intentional about going after maybe some some new and different opportunities, even growth opportunities that matter to you. Is that right? right? That's right. So, okay. All right. So to First, be clear, it's not about age and it's not about being retired. Okay. It's about, it's a bit of a, a state of mind and where you're in a position where you can begin to take and exert more control over your choices. Got it. Got it. So what's interesting, I think Paul and I actually entered our phase two at sort of a young age, and in part because we didn't have as many obligations not having had children, Mm -hmm. um, we got very intentional and purposeful about creating that life. Um, And I love that you said it doesn't matter what age you are because there are a lot of people who really can create their circumstances. Maybe, Maybe they're at a stage where they still have kids, but that doesn't mean that you can't enter phase two, right? That's right, that's exactly right. All right, so let's talk a little bit about um, when when is the right time to start thinking about mm-hmm. this phase two? Well, one of the things that I think serves you well, regardless of what stage of life you're in, is I think it's very important. I've heard you talk about it before, about setting 
tangible and measurable goals. Mm -hmm. And when I say goals, I mean personal goals, professional goals, relationship goals, Mm -hmm. family goals. There's a a lot of things that you can set for yourself. And if you did that in your professional career, where your career, the the work part of your career was your primary endeavor, then you're probably going to be in a position where you can begin to think about phase two, because Phase two doesn't happen by accident. You have to actually be thinking about it, and you don't think about it in the moment. You have to start thinking about it years in advance, and I would say at least five years in advance. I actually, similar to you, had a couple of opportunities earlier in my career where I was thinking, I'm ready to do this. I didn't call it phase two. I'm ready to do that, but I actually realized that I didn't even know what I wanted to do. I hadn't put a plan together, and I became incredibly bored almost immediately. And so I would tell you that timing does matter, but it's preparation and planning that matters more. And so you'll know when you're ready because when you clock out that last day on your kind of traditional job, or you leave what you're doing in the past and start a new venture that you've never done before, you'll know you're ready because your job jar and your list of to-dos is probably as long or as longer than what you had before. If you go into phase two believing you're in phase two, and your job jar is play tennis and go golfing and go visit and travel, that's really not phase two. That sounds like retirement. That's retirement, right. So I love that you distinguish that. Right, and I I don't consider myself to be retired, have no interest in describing any of what I'm talking about as retirement, even though many retired people are in phase two. So I really, really like this conversation. I know people who have actually transitioned from their jobs, their businesses, from high level executives. And without that intentional desire, that 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 plan, um, I have seen I've seen some wreckage, right? Mm-hmm. Where um, you know those who have really had their entire identity wrapped around their career right. and their position and their network step away from that network, and and quite frankly, they they feel lost, right? right? In fact, and, in fact, what I think you probably noticed is that. People who identify themselves by the words on their business card are not ready for phase two. Mm. That's the bottom line. Because if what you believe is the importance of your contribution to the world is contained on a, a small index card or a business card that has your title and your company, there's nothing wrong with that, but you're not ready for phase two. You have to be thinking about if I didn't have a business card or if I was at a cocktail party or if I was playing tennis with somebody and they say, what do you do? And if you don't have a good answer that you're proud of, you're not ready for phase two. If you have to say, well, I used to be a really important person, um, you're not ready for phase two. Yeah. Oh, that's a good challenge. So do you have, when somebody says to you, what do you Mm -hmm. do? If you're no longer in your role, if you no longer carry that identity, Mm -hmm. what do you say? What do you want to say? Who do you want to be? Who do you want to become? I think that's a really, really great and introspective question. Now, I know from experience that people are really going to struggle with this conversation. And I and I know that if you if you ask the average person what's next for you Mm -hmm. in retirement, most often the thought of retirement is stop. I stop working. Right. And there isn't much more other than golf or tennis or bridge or whatever the you know the standard kinds of things are that's travel right. travel that's right. right yeah and again and there's again I think those are all great parts of life and I obviously I, I'm into fitness and I'm into travel and I I love to see and do things but I just don't think that's that's not what I'm referring to it's just that's yeah. an element of it for sure um, when I was in my career my kind of my pure professional career um, I had had the benefit of a lot of mentors and I think Um, again, depending on who's listening to this broadcast, um, let's say you're in your mid-30s and you're you're climbing the ladder and you're doing your thing and you're trying to do the best you can for yourself and your family. Um, It's obviously great to have people that are willing to help you, but I would tell you that I found that regardless of whether I was a mentor or whether I was being mentored, that you have to own your career and you have to own how you live your entire life. You can't expect a company or a boss or you know, a parent or anybody to kind of be responsible for that. And so the model that I learned from one of my mentors was this idea of 10,000 working days. And when people think about 10,000 working days, it sounds sort of like a mortality thing, but it's really not that. It's basically easy math. If you work traditionally 40 years times 250 days per year, that's 10,000. The math, the math is easy. So that's why I use that number. However, you know, 
I think most of us would agree that during the heat of our career, we're probably working more than 250 a year. And we hope we don't have to work 40 years necessarily to get to phase two or to, to the, the next level of your life. However, um, of those 10,000 days, the thing that I always advise people and I learned for myself is that every day at the end of the day, you have to look back and say, what did I do with one of those days? Mm -hmm. And again, it's not about mortality. It's about how do you want to invest your time and what goals are you trying to seek? And so part of phase two is doing a good job on your 10,000 working days. Because as I mentioned at the very beginning, this is about taking control of your life and you know having more choices. And so if you're not putting money away for 401ks and you're not taking care of your college education for your kids and you're not dealing with all the mortgage issues that everyone has, then it's really hard to have a lot of choices if your financial flexibility is so limited. So I believe that use your 10,000 working days to achieve kind of on the hierarchy of needs, kind of the basic stuff, the financial security, all the things that you think you need to do, but never, never lose sight of the fact that your goal in life isn't to die on the job. I have way too many friends uh, in the tech industry who basically put all their time and energy into a company and were forgotten the day that they died. And that's not really what we want to have people do. That's not a very good kind of ending of your life. And so what I would love to see people do is try to take care of those issues as early as possible so that you have the choice. And I know everyone can't do that, but I think it's still a good goal to pursue. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great goal to pursue. So what are some of the keys to success, would you say, in phase two? Um, I think that it really still comes down to the same thing that if you want to call it phase one, which is setting personal, professional, and relationship goals. Okay. And everyone's going to have a different set of them. Um, I think the difference is, is really, really, really trying to be open to change, trying new things, uh, you know, getting out of your comfort zone. Um, you know, if I talked about my own personal situation, I, I want to stay connected to the tech industry, but I really don't want to be tied to it anymore. Mm -hmm. And so I spend as much time as I can learning about things outside of what I did for 30 years. And that's really important to me because it helps me develop new skills. Um, you might be pleased to know, or maybe even a little bit surprised to know, that I consider myself to be a reasonably competent bike mechanic. And that's something I learned as a result of this bike company I'm associated with. So let's talk about that. I, I'd really like for you to give a couple of practical examples from your okay. own world about how you designed your phase two. Okay, so what, what I did in my phase two and how I thought through it is um, I knew that I wanted to stay connected to my core industry because I think it's important from a networking standpoint and just keeping in touch with what's going on. The tech industry was very, was very, um, beneficial to me and I like to continue to give back. Many of my former employees are now in senior management positions in big companies and I really like to stay connected with them. So the way I do that is I, I've been on a number of uh, both public and private company boards and I can mentor, mentor senior leadership, mentor, mentor the CEOs that are in those businesses. That's the easy part, that's kind of the straightforward part. I think almost anybody that leaves the industry typically wants to have some connection to it unless they mm -hmm. hated their job. But I loved my job and I had a lot of different interesting jobs. I just didn't want to be a slave to my career. And so staying connected to that was one part of the preparation. Um, so I really like that that's one of the first, uh, you know, criteria that you had is that, you know, keeping that network, staying connected with your industry. For those out there who are just now contemplating, you know, leaving, you know, if they're ready to phase out of their, their day jobs, their mm -hmm. careers, what do you recommend for them in terms of finding the right kinds of boards to serve on to stay connected with that industry? So do you have a do you have a checklist? Do you have criteria of who you work with? Is it relationship driven? It's it's mostly relationship driven. Okay. Obviously there's there's a whole industry of people that connect individuals to boards but the reality is is I find that at least in the board searches I've I've con uh, conducted that the the lead candidates end up being personal referrals um, and obviously um, you want to be associated with something that uses your unique skills so let's for example say that you were really expert at cyber security that's a very hot topic for every kind of company people are always worried about that so if you have a real deep competence in that then basically use that as your entree into why somebody would want that kind of skill set on your board. Um, and so, you know, th that's just an example. But I would tell you at the end of the day, if you if you think, let's say you're 50 years old or 55 years old and you want to start joining boards and you just start that process at 55, you probably won't be successful. You need to start building those relationships when you're in management positions, when you're meeting other board members of your own company and others that you deal with as a customer or a supplier. Early on. 
um, in really. your career. And, and be- because it's it's about it's about being known. And I can tell you that what's really nice about board work, if you want to talk about that for a second, is that um, if you're successful in one board, the next board will come without much effort. And I've been on, I think, 11 boards in my career. And I started my first one when I was in my late 30s. And so, you know, I started very early. And I think to the extent you can do that, that's certainly helpful. Okay, good to know. Um, keep going. Talk, okay, uh, talk so, about your so, personal so phase, there's, too. So then the next part of it is kind of the intellectual part of it. So um, you want to talk about how do you want to stay connected and how do you want to kind of grow yourself intellectually. And I think in, in my particular case, um, in addition to kind of staying connected to the industry, I wanted to get involved in something that was a, actually a personal preference or a personal passion of mine. And so this, this company, Elliptigo, um, I, you know, it, it kind of came as at the right time nine or ten years ago. Um, Elliptigo is a, essentially, think about it this way, um, it's a bike and an elliptical machine that if you kind of mushed them together, if they had a baby, it would look like this. <laughs> So what, you, what you're what you talking about is um, essentially a bike frame with an elliptical motion, not a circular motion, so an elliptical motion that you can ride on the street, has either 8 or 11 gears, and allows you to kind of exercise outdoors. And the reason that's relevant to me is that when I was younger, I was big into distance running, and I had men- a meniscus tear in my right knee. Doctor basically said, you know, unless you want to be... Uh, crippled when you have grandchildren, you better pick something else to work on. So I stopped doing marathons and I tried to find something interesting. I found biking very boring, indoor exercising. I, I found that you, know, you spent most of your time trying to distract yourself. And I ran into literally um, through the Wall Street Journal, I saw a small article on this company called Elliptigo. And basically they had come up with an invention that really ma- married biking and running and put it in a way where you could do it without impact on your joints. And so nine years ago, I got involved as a customer. Then I joined their board. I became an investor, and now I'm one of the owners. And so it's one of these things where that passion allows me to now be a, a reasonably good bike mechanic because I've so worked on it for so long. You take you take your passion for exercise. Mm-hmm. For you know, you're you're very athletic, and. I'm sorry about your meniscus, but I can't imagine how you'd be playing tennis otherwise if you were also, (laughs) you're already incredible on the court. So um, to be able to keep that level of fitness up Mm -hmm. without doing the running, without being stuck in a gym is is incredible. And actually, Paul and I got to go on a look to go ride with Mike um, not too too long ago. What Mm -hmm. I want to do is I want to put a link to a quick video in the in the show notes so that people can actually see what that looks like if you've never if you've never tried this before you got to get on one because it is a completely different experience to bike riding and it's a completely different experience to an elliptical but it is uh, like a hybrid of the That's two right. and we've sold 30,000 of them and we're very proud of wow. that and this is a this is a classic example of um, a couple of guys, uh, they were in San Diego, California, both were injured athletes that that came up with a solution to a problem that they had, and it was the same problem I had, and I feel really good about contributing some of my energy to helping them succeed. You know, our next goal is to get to 50,000 and then 100,000 bikes, but it's, it's basically a good way to exercise outdoors without having any impact on your knees or your joints, which right. is important. So if you have a physical injury and you're one of those athletes that just, you know, doesn't want to be kept down, mm-hmm. this is a great, this is a great tool right. for them. So, so. Um, and it's, yeah, and it's super fun. So um, outside of, all right, so you've stayed connected with your industry by serving on the boards. Mm-hmm. You've gotten involved now as an investor owner of Elliptigo. What else is there or what's next? In my opinion, probably the most exciting part of it. I love Elliptigo. I love my industry. But I think the giving back part of it is Mm. the the most gratifying. And so in my particular case, um, like all of us, we probably have some level of affection for either our undergraduate or master's school, wherever we went to. And I, um, I've been on the board of trustees at the University of Dayton, which is where I did my undergrad for the last eight years. And now I oversee the investment committee, which is really the endowment. Mm-hmm. And so it's a very, you know, it's a volunteer thing. And um, you certainly don't do it for money. You do it because you want to see the university continue to succeed. And so that's been an example of giving back. But more locally, um, what I found 
probably the only good thing that came out of Hurricane Irma for me personally a couple years ago is that I got connected to a group that was doing terrific work kind of doing first responder type of support for people affected by the uh, hurricane. Mm -hmm. And so it happened to be Catholic Charities. And I started working with those guys and it was really everything from organizing delivery of water and diapers and all the things that needed to get to people. And then it's kind of transformed itself into kind of, more, of a more regular kind of assignment that they've given me to help with the distribution of goods and services all over the county. Mm -hmm. And so that is, you know, th there's nothing glory, glor gloryful or, or full of glory in that, this particular case of doing that. It's really, it's, it's just gratifying and, and rewarding because you're, you're physically just helping people. And you don't have time to do that as much as you'd like to early in your life. And so I believe that's probably one of the best um, examples in my personal life of where phase two has allowed me to, you know, to give back in a way that I wouldn't have been able to do before. It's kind of easy to give money and there's nothing wrong with that, but it's, it's even more min meaningful to try to actually help people that really need the help and that, you know, can benefit from what you do. And what's cool is it sounds like you found that passion just along the way based on circumstance mm -hmm. versus you know, because I'm sure there are people out there who want to contribute and give back and they're not exactly sure what their cause is, mm -hmm. right? Um, but so finding that first responder really came out of necessity after the hurricane. Yeah, I mean, it was it was a little bit circumstantial, but you know, you're always looking, at least in my mind, I've always tried to find something that, that would be useful. I have, you know, family members that have a particular passion or want me to support them in a certain way. But this was one that just hit me very directly. I mm -hmm. mean, we were very fortunate for the most part in yeah. this area to not have more devastation, but there were parts of this area that were devastated. Absolutely. And those people needed our help, and they didn't need our help just for a day. They needed it for months. Mm -hmm. And from that standpoint, it just gave me something to get excited about where you know the reward is really about helping others yeah. um, so you know as I look as I look going forward um, the one thing that you know is kind of the last leg of this stool so you know the connection to the, the profession the, the the business new new ideas like a lift to go doing the giving back stuff um, I think the last part of it which is just is it's so unique to each individual it's even hard to kind of talk about is you know find something that is so not what people think you're going to do and do it and mm. you know the bike mechanic thing's a little bit outside the the radar screen for most people yeah probably wouldn't have seen that coming um however um the part that i am really excited about that i've begun to do um, I guess I started almost nine months ago, as I'm writing a play. It's going to be on Broadway someday, Heather, so you must get your dress ready for the Absolutely. big event. Absolutely. But in any event, it's going to be awesome. And I don't even care if it ever goes there. I'm having such a great time writing it. And is a an original kind of a historical fiction type of play. And it takes place in Europe in 1939. And you're probably saying, how did you come up with that? How did you? I was why, actually why thinking. Are we, why are we talking about this? And the only reason I bring it up is because um, if you have done much running or you're into fitness, you hear this concept of a runner's high. Yeah. And I believe in that. And I've had that occur me to me. It's it's not like the green flash where I've never seen it. The runner's <laughs> high. Right. The runner's high. I I it's know real. what that's like. Yeah. And that's when I when I was distance running, that's when I did my most creative thinking. And so the elliptigo has been the only thing that I'm able to substitute for that, um, where I'm able to get the runner's high. And I was literally uh, riding on a long ride, and I came up with the idea when I was in kind of a zoning out in my runner's high. And as it turned out, it's it's a story that um, I keep showing it to a lot of people, and I'm on revision 8.0. And like I said, someday I hope that somebody that legitimately will look at it. But even if they don't, I've gotten a, just a ton of fun and a ton of satisfaction out of it. And I hope maybe someday we can do something with it. And did you have any sort of theatrical background or playwriting in your history? Like, did you uh, no, take that I, in college? I, or? Love, I love to go to plays. I've been okay. to a lot of Broadway plays. I love to go to movies. But I think probably the common element is I love music and okay. I love writing. Um, so applying it to writing a musical or writing a play mm -hmm. is um, sort of the connection. But at the end of the day, I like writing and I think I'm a reasonably creative guy. Uh -huh. And so I want to at least try to, you know, I've, I've watched a really a lot of bad Broadway plays that, that seem to be acceptable in the world. <laughs> and I'm thinking, I can do better. I that. can do that. And so my view on this thing is that it is, 
it's it's completely just throwing a coin in the fountain and see what happens and i just can't tell you how passionate about it because as you can tell by my face i'm yeah. just so excited about just the idea of trying it and there are so many people that think it's kind of just one of those things that i'll i'll kind of pass through but there's others that actually believe i'm serious about it and i am wow well so. i'm so excited for you on on the play piece yeah. Well, and honestly, just the completion of the play, even if you started a community theater and make your way to Broadway, like just the fact that you did it and you accomplished it and it was out of the box for you. That's yeah, so like I said, cool. it, it's, we, we've been talking about phase two this whole time and it's just one more layer of what I consider phase two. And again, what I would tell Heather and Paul and the rest of your audience is that there's no magic to this. It's really just, you know, kind of finding and planning what you want to do in that stage in your life, whether you're in your 30s, 40s, 50s, it doesn't matter what year you're at. It's just when you're at that point in your life where you can and want to take control and kind of change the vector of what you're doing in your life. And that's and, what I think is important. You know what's so cool about this is that uh, you absolutely can begin to take on aspects of phase two right now, wherever you are, mm -hmm. whatever age you are, by trying some of these new things, I mean, you could still be gainfully employed and raising a family and decide to start writing if that's a that's passion. Right. That's right. And have you, Mike, tried anything along the way that you decided was not for you and then tried again? I mean, it, did you oh, just sure, fall sure. into exactly no, what you wanted to do? Not at all. I think that um, if you did, that would be that'd be hugely lucky. Um, you know, it's everything from businesses that I was interested in that I ended up not being interested in. It's all about, you know, there's been a couple of boards I've been on that I really regretted being on. Okay. Um, the giving back part of it's been consistently positive. Um, I just, you know, wish I could carve off even more time for that. But I've loved being on the board of trustees at my undergraduate. I've loved being part of this Catholic Charities activity. And I wish I could do more. Um, but, you know, you have a certain number of hours in the day, any way you look at it, and yeah. you have to, and you still have to play tennis, too, so you got to And you have in. to make sure you have time for tennis. That's right. So, um, just out of curiosity, is there anything else that's left on that phase two list that you haven't mentioned yet that's like, okay, when I'm done with the play, I want to do this unique, interesting, you'd mm -hmm. never guess it kind of thing? Um, I don't have that. You don't have it I yet? Think, I think the runway for some of the things I'm working on is going to take a while. Okay. And um, like I said, I wouldn't order your dress yet, but you know, <laughs> some point in the future, you may be on the red carpet. Uh, you know what? I'm ordering the dress now. <laughs> I just, I just kind of think, with, look, your success in your tech career it has spilled over into so many different aspects of your life because of who you are. I mean, mm -hmm. your, your, your leadership, the fact that you have, you know, taken on mentors all along the way who have poured into you. Like you are this combination of a lot of different people mm -hmm. who, you know, that you just go after what you want. So I would not be at all surprised um, if your play turns out to be a huge well, hit. Well, and, and like I think almost every successful person, they, they really have to kind of be, uh, they have to be humbled by the fact that so much of your life is a little bit about luck and circumstance. So I don't take for granted at all some of the success, the apparent success I've had, not because I didn't work hard for it, but because there's a lot of other people that worked equally as hard mm -hmm. that maybe didn't get the break or didn't get the, you know, the nod at the right time. And it starts from, do you have a strong family foundation of how you were raised? Do you have a strong marriage or do you have strong relationships? Do you have a good relationship with your children? I mean, there's a lot of things that can kind of get in the way of your success. And so, you know, every day is a, is a new challenge, but as long as you're kind of generally heading in the right direction, it's amazing what you can accomplish in your life. Yeah. Well, and underlying all of that, of course, are your values, right? And what mm -hmm. you stand for as a human being. Uh, again, thank you to all of our listeners for tuning in to the Evolve to Win show. Again, we're with Mike Ruffalo. We will put his uh, contact information for Elliptigo oh, in sure. the show notes. Can we do that? Absolutely. Uh, and if you happen to be in Southwest Florida and want to do a test drive, you might be able to talk him into that. But I'll tell so. you, so. it's, uh, it's a blast. And you might get a laugh out of the video link that we put on the show notes as well. So thanks again for being with us and thanks to our listeners for tuning in.